And I love this tiny habit philosophy of saying, okay, something as simple as breathing, because some of us may be listening and saying, okay, I know, breathe in, breathe out, do this, do that. It's like, no, no, seriously, something as small as that can actually bring you back to where you're in control. And the celebration, I love it, is just training yourself. I'm Clint Hoops, and this is the Unrivaled Man Podcast. The Unrivaled Man is where we help businessmen like you be the unrivaled leader in their work and home. We're revealing the perspective you've been missing to upgrade your identity and become better husbands, fathers, family men, and business owners. Let's get started. Welcome to the Unrivaled Man Podcast. So excited to have you here today, and I am very excited to have with me my guest for today. His name is Paul Shepard, and he is an anxiety and mindset coach and host of the top 10 podcast, Mindset Change. Paul trained in therapy and coaching since the age of 17 as he was struggling with an anxiety disorder which therapy, due to its limitations, failed to treat. Paul explored healing his anxiety using a holistic approach, which inspired his very successful and evolving anxiety to confidence coaching program with which he coaches people around the world, online or in his office, which is based in Brighton in the UK. Paul, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me on. This is very exciting. Very exciting. Well, Paul and I, we have known each other for, uh, oh gosh, it's the beginning of the year now. And we were connected and man, it's been, it's been really fun getting to know you. No, no, the same, the same. It's, we have a lot in common. Thank you so much for bringing me onto the show because we've got a lot to talk about. We have a lot to talk about. We do. Is But Paul and I have talked quite a bit over the last several months about men and anxiety because I primarily support you know, married businessmen. And Paul happens to help many men that have had all types of anxiety in all parts of their lives. And so we felt like, man, often men don't want to talk about anxiety because they feel weak and they feel like they should be able to do it by themselves and handle it all by themselves. And it's something that I see as a, as a real issue. And so Paul and I, as we were talking, we said, man, Paul needs to be on the show. People need to hear this and realize some of the things that they can do. Absolutely. So Paul, as we get started today, why is it, why do you feel that men don't want to talk about anxiety? I think it's cultural. I think men are giving in a sort of, you know, it's toxic masculinity, which it kind of promotes the idea that men are weak if they open up. There's a sense of vulnerability, which men see as, you know, negative. So therefore it's this whole idea that they ought to do it by themselves. They should be able to work this all out by themselves and then they'll be fine, but it's not the case. And that's the toxic part of the toxic masculinity, right? Yeah. It's a message that you should do this all by yourself. Guys don't open up. Guys don't need to talk about it. Sort it out yourself. And yet that's crazy because if you or I wanted to go to the gym and learn to work the equipment, we wouldn't be expected to know this stuff all by ourselves. We would get training. We would get help. We would have coaching for it. And yet when it comes to mental health, guys are expected or they expect themselves to know this stuff all by themselves. And that creates that barrier to reaching out because it's almost like this sense of shame that if I reach out, then I somehow have failed. And that really isn't the case. But that's the message I hear quite a lot, that if I reach out, there's something wrong with me and I'm going to be embarrassed. It seems as though in recent years, it has become a little more accepted, I guess you could say, to be able to talk about some of these things. But still, it's far from where it needs to be, because I I know for myself that this is something that I'm uncomfortable talking about very often, 
which is honestly part of the reason I wanted to have you on the show to be able to help help us all be a little more open about it because we don't talk about this that much. And it is, it's something that we do fear. I, I find myself in that same boat where I often don't want to talk about it because I don't want to come across, like you're saying, I don't want to come across as weak. I love the idea of, like you were saying, we need the tools to be able to to handle these things, just like any emotions, right? When we're young, we have to learn, you know, you're you're a little three-year-old and you have a temper tantrum and, you know, your mom sits you down and tells you to to handle your temper and she helps you get the tools to be able to to work through it. But as you get older, your mom isn't sitting down with you anymore, right? <laughs> Saying, let's work through this. Well, your mom, that, that sounds good, but a lot of parents don't actually, I mean, when I was growing up, if, if I was upset, it's pretty much ignored or, you know, it's if I tried to, because I couldn't communicate, I was a kid. So I was the lucky one, right? Yeah, you think you're a lucky one. Yeah, yeah, that would sit you down, right? I had very aloof parents. It was they were very practical, you know, roof over our heads and fed and uh, made sure I got to school. But when it came to any type of emotional support and discussing why I was upset, it was kind of just shut up, go to your room. When I as I was growing up, I didn't have an outlet or a way of learning to communicate that it was okay to talk about feelings. And that is the same for a lot of men. And not just men, women as well, but it's, you know, we don't encourage young children. I mean, I think it's getting better, as you said, but we don't encourage children to open up and talk about their feelings. They can be shamed. And then when they're shamed, oh, this is a bad thing. Then as we grow into teens and and, and becoming older, that program from when we're children still remains. Talking about feelings equals shame. And it still stays instead of being able to talk about their feelings and say and be able to work through it, right? Absolutely, because again, it's learning to work with your emotions and learning to work with your feelings is a gift that just keeps on giving, really does. Learning to know what you're feeling, being able to express what you're feeling without worrying what another person will think of you, with, you know, the judgment side of things. I had a previous guest here on the show. Her name is Lisa Welsher. And she is an expert on emotional intelligence and teaches business leaders in, on those side of things. And one thing that she said is she says there's no negative emotions is one of her philosophies. That's one of her beliefs in that there is just information, right? The emotions are, are just information. She speaks about kind of similar things where she says oh, some of these poor children are having these emotions that are so real and so big and they're being told that they're wrong. Once again, and having the shame side, and it continues throughout our adult life. Same kind of thing. Some of these feelings that they're they're wrong when really they're just information for us. No, it, it is absolutely. Uh, but what begins to happen is because of, of society pressure, guys still stay closed. You know, boys don't cry. And girls are seen as over-emotional, <laughs> emotional creatures, <laughs> So it's almost expected of women to be able to open up and talk. Whereas with guys, it's just, just stay quiet. Pull your socks up, sort it out yourself. And I'll tell you is so many boys and men, we look at other people in similar situations to us and we start comparing ourselves and thinking they have it all figured out, right? which is the whole reason that I started the unrivaled man, right? I mean, because really unrivaled man means, unrivaled means no competition. It means no comparison. I mean, that's the reason for the name of the show is that very thing. And so when we start talking about this, I start realizing really the unrivaled man is someone who has courage to share and to talk and is not afraid of the comparison of others or being compared in that way, or comparing themselves to others, which can cause some of this, some of this anxiety in my view. That is strength. It, it does take a bit of training. This isn't something that is going to come natural for a lot of people. But when you see the value in opening up and you are okay with putting yourself in a vulnerable position because your brain has a new narrative that says, this is going to be good for me. Yeah, it's going to feel a bit scary, but the benefits for me and people around me are massive because it isn't just, you know, it's not just the guy who's going to be affected if he can't open up. This will impact his family, his wife, his children, anyone that's close to him who he's not able to be honest with. You know, I love what you just said. So I love your podcast is the courage 
to be open. And it does take courage. Anyone can stay silent, but it does take courage. And to have courage, courage doesn't come without having feelings of fear, because it wouldn't be called courage otherwise. It's going to feel a bit frightening. You're exactly right. We forget that sometimes, right? We forget the side that, that going through courage is going through the fear. Yeah, yeah there's, got to be, there's going to be fear attached. And that's why it's really important to work with the brain and body, to work with your thoughts, to learn to work with your feelings. And one of the things that I teach my clients, and they love this, it's one of the things that I've done for years, and they mention time after time after time after again, is that I taught them how to work with our autonomic nervous system. So we have the parasympathetic, which is attached, and we have the sympathetic. So when we breathe in, we actually stimulate ourselves and we begin to stimulate the sympathetic, which is part of the limbic system, which is our flight and fight response. So as we breathe in, we become a little bit more alert. And when we breathe out, and when we extend the out breath, we trigger the parasympathetic nervous system. And the parasympathetic nervous system tells the brain we are safe. Also enables healing mode. The body can sort itself out. When someone learns to work with their autonomic nervous system, they access decent resources. They can strengthen their resources in their mind, their confidence. They can access rationality, logic. But if they're, act if they're on reactive mode because their sympathetic is too activated, then they're more likely to be more reactive instead of proactive. And the confidence and the relaxation that can come from learning just to breathe out longer than you breathe in, so simple, but learning to breathe out longer than you breathe in has a real impact on the cognitive function of your brain. That's interesting. So it actually slows down the fight or flight reflex, essentially. It kind of it kind of slows everything down, makes your mind start kind of functioning properly again so you can kind of see reality a little bit again, right? Yeah, because we're in reactive mode otherwise. We're looking for all of the dangers, right? Yep. We're looking for, the brain will go, what's the problem? He's breathing as if they, there's an issue, you know? So for shallow breathing or we're breathing in longer than we breathe out. Yeah, the brain is thinking, okay, it's going on to alert mode, what's the problem? So opening up and being more honest is gonna be more difficult because the brain is gonna focus on the fear of shame, fear of judgment, fear of something going wrong. Whereas just by learning to work with your autonomic nervous system, and that way you can also begin to train the brain to have different cognitive responses, you have much more in the way of control. You now have choice, whereas if you don't learn it, it's going to be a bit of a you know, hit or miss. It could be potluck of what happens next. I mean, it's funny. It's funny how tools work throughout our lives, right? Because we have the same kind of minds. I think about my children. I've had uh, times with our kids where you have some of those parenting books that'll say, you know, if your kids are, are throwing a tantrum or having a, throwing a fit of some sort, that if you can just breathe with them, you know, kind of sit and breathe in, breathe out, kind of calm them down that way that it'll help them calm down, which we've done with our kids. And it, and it works a lot of the time and really helps them kind of calm down. And I never really thought about it in, in these terms, right? Because they're throwing a tantrum because they see something in their world that's, that's off, I guess. And so they have this reaction and, and the breathing can kind of, it sounds like it's, it's kind of doing what you're describing, right? I mean, how do you think that's working with the kids? Yeah, when your brain thinks you're in danger, a special emotional dangers. They're known as, I teach my clients, these are false alarms. The brain is going, I'm in danger from opening up. I'm in danger of reaching out. That's a false alarm because you can instantly feel a visceral physical action to that, uh, so physical response. So when you actually learn to work with your nervous system by hijacking it back, longer out breaths, breathing down to the diaphragm, takes it a bit deeper. Now I can begin to see the, you know, the truth, the reality. And you can begin to choose what you do next instead of just being reactive. Because, I mean, we've all done it. We've all reacted at times just because we're caught up in that flight or fight response. And we might be a bit embarrassed later on of how we behaved. And yet what we can do quite easily is reverse that and prevent that happening much less by learning how to breathe properly. I mean, most people say to me, it's really quite funny, they do say, oh, but what if I forget to breathe? What if I forget? <laughs> like, you're still, you, unless you're going to go blue. We'll attend your funeral. <laughs> it's like, eventually it's got to kick you in. That was a terrible joke, but I'm just... No, it's true though, but it's, uh, people do worry that they're not going to breathe. 
And yet it's such a simple tool to learn. And the more you practice it. And I joked about that, but that's a very real thing that people experience. So, But when you practice these tools, you know, that's what a training program that I created is, you know, it's practice, practice, practice. And you've looked at BJ Fogg's uh, Tiny Habits and you're looking at the celebration. And it, when you celebrate your new habit, you add a little bit of celebration onto what you're learning, your brain becomes more motivated to make it, you know, make it happen next time too. Some of our listeners may not have heard of the tiny habits philosophy. Would you mind expanding just a few seconds on that, on how we can apply that tiny habit philosophy to, to the breathing, kind of how that would work? Well, again, it's just two ways. It's, it's One is if you're worrying about that you become reactive to a negative situation. So say you have a negative thought and it's a type of thought you may end up ruminating on and find yourself reacting to negatively, badly. So maybe this is kind of your normal habit. This is kind of the thing that you find yourself getting into, right? Kind of that you find yourself doing this going there quite often. And this might be a way that you can help. Yeah. So if you get caught up in a negative thought trap, you can, with a bit of training, become aware of the thought. A negative thought equals, I'm now going to take a nice big deep breath. And by breathing down to the diaphragm, breathing out longer, yeah, you begin to loosen the thought. So I tell my clients, what is the negative thought? And they'll say, it's a false alarm. Without the breath, the thought actually feels real. But with the breath, now becomes the understanding, this is a false alarm. And then they say, I am safe. And then they usually just do a yes. So the celebration is very important. The negative thought equals a new habit, the breath, then a label of what the thought actually is. It's a false alarm. And the realization, I'm not in danger, I'm actually safe. And then we celebrate that with a yes. So again, it, it stimulates dopamine, stimulates your neurochemistry so that your brain next time, the next time you have that negative thought process, which can take you down a spiral, can get quite dark. But this time you've got the breath beginning to happen more automatically. You've got the, I'm not in danger. This is just a false alarm. And then you've got the yes to celebrate the fact that you caught it. The celebration, it's very, very true. Emotion follows action. I love that. Emotion follows action. Yeah, yeah. One of the most dangerous things we can ever get caught up in is waiting to feel motivated, waiting to feel emotional to go and do something. It's not going to, we are flaky. That's not going to happen. So learning to create action first and celebrate with emotion. Because uh, again, we feel good about after we've done something. Because otherwise you need outside stimulus to be able to move forward, right? Yeah. It, it's, you know, it's lots of things that people don't do because they're sat waiting, like at the bus stop, waiting for emotion to come and say, well, you're going to feel motivated now. You can do this. And it's like, oh, thank God for that. Because now I feel motivated to do it. I'm going to do it. Action is needed first. And then we celebrate the action. We celebrate that tiny step. And then just a yes. I can't express to people how important that is. Yeah, because if you don't celebrate, it's got to be done in your way. You could sing a, a song, you could do a little shoulder shuffle and a jig, you could do whatever you like. It doesn't have to be a yes. It's got to be something that means something to you. But you've caught the thought. And you're going to feel good that you didn't go down that spiral. Because I said it, your family could pay for you going down that spiral. They're the ones where you may be grumpy towards or distancing yourself from. And yet these are the most important people in your life. And a thought is preventing you from connecting because you've learned from a young age that actually these thoughts, you shouldn't be talking about them, you shouldn't be expressing them, you shouldn't be allowing yourself to have them in any shape or form. And negative thoughts are normal. They're natural, but we can change the channel. I love that idea of the tiny habit because... Sometimes it is the very small things that make all the difference, right? Our entire lives are formed with just a series of little small decisions that we make. And unfortunately, some of these decisions on how we react to some of these ones that have higher emotion attached can be a small decision that can impact the rest of our life in a really big way. Like you said, at work and at home, all of these places, it can impact the way we show up. And I love this tiny habit philosophy of saying, okay, Something as simple as breathing, because some of us may be listening and saying, okay, I know, breathe in, breathe out, do this, do that. It's like, no, no, seriously, something as small as that can actually bring you back to where you're in control. And the celebration, I love it, is just training yourself. Absolutely. Yeah. 
And you won't know until you actually start practicing how this works. You know, when I work with clients, I say to them, look, I can show you the best technique in the world, but unless you feel it working, it's going to mean nothing to you. And that's the whole point of practice, that they get to experience it in its reality. And I've never had anyone come back and say, well, that breathing thing didn't work. (laughs) Because that's how our nervous system works. As we breathe in, it's like foot on the gas. As you breathe out, it's foot off the gas. But if you're breathing hectically and shallowly, then your foot is on the gas too much, being very greedy with the cortisol and adrenaline. So as I said, it's take the foot off the gas, learn to breathe out longer than you breathe in, and you'll gain much more in the way of control. You do need training in regards to how to work cognitively after that. I know know that you do some great coaching work in a different way with anxiety. You need training. It needs work because your quality of life or your family will suffer. Yeah. It's an interesting thing. This is where people do turn to outside stimulus of some sort, often substance abuse, because they're searching, right? They're searching for that relief. And in the end, the relief is within their own control, but unfortunately it doesn't, like you said, they haven't been trained on how to work with that. And that's a scary thing. It is a scary thing. I just, I was doing some research earlier and even this statistic shocked me, but 77.9% of all suicides are men. Oh my goodness. So nearly 80% of all suicides are men. That's crazy. One in the US every 12 minutes. Not just men, but there's a suicide every 12 minutes. I know not all men are fathers, right? Or husbands, but they have a lot of people that care about them either way. But when I think of all of the children, and they may not even be all young children, they might be adult children, but it's a reality. It's the same. All of these poor children and wives that are left alone because of that. That's a tragedy. That is so many more. So why so many more men than women? Well, again, it's it's that lack of being able to open up. And also, you mentioned, in a way, self-medicating. So men turn towards drugs, they turn towards drink, they turn towards porn, they turn towards gambling. Again, it's there's a lack of self-care that begins to creep in. And they're seeking. And all of those that you just mentioned all change your mind. Yeah, they rewire the brain hideously. I did a video on TikTok talking about the mental health impact of porn on the brain. Over a million people watched it because, as I said, it's, and it's one of these things that men around the world reach out and say, oh God, I'm really embarrassed, but I am watching too much porn. And one of the most devastating effects of it, besides changing the way that your brain deals with its rewards, so you begin to extreme, you know, you chase more extreme porn, is that you begin to become turned off of making love to your partner. I mean, who who would ever want that? And this is just one side effect, let alone what drugs d- d- does to a person, what alcohol can do to a person. One step farther, even on the pornography side of things, it's such a tragedy, is like you said, the husband becomes turned off to their partner. But what happens to the poor children from there? Because your children learn their example of how to have a healthy relationship in the future is your relationship with your spouse. That is how they learn what a healthy relationship looks like. And when they look at your relationship, and even though they don't see your intimate relationship, that pornography will change the relationship that everyone sees as well. It changes the way you look at at your spouse and your kids see that. And so then it trickles down, right? Yeah. It's a, oh, it's a fun thing. It's not harmful, especially there's a, there is a, again, it's a toxic masculinity side of things. This is what men do. It's what you should have a look at. And the impact on mental health is a tragedy. I really think it is. It's so dark. And I get young guys in their 20s reaching out saying, I know I'm watching too much. And this is the impact it's having on me and my relationship with my girlfriend or my wife. And these are young people, let alone people in their 30s and 40s. And as I said, it's become too extreme. And it does lead towards depression. It can lead towards strong anxieties, body image issues. Yeah, real problems, as I said. But it's still one of these things that people turn to as a form of self-medicating. Oh, my goodness. So if somebody's listening right now, what can they do for someone that's struggling with, once again, they have anxiety or they have other issues that 
they may not even fully realize that's why they're coping with life, right? They may not have, have called it that yet, but life is hard, right? And they're coping with it in one of these ways, pornography, substance abuse, or just holding it all in, right? And just experiencing perhaps poor health or poor motivation to exercise or all of these different things that can affect their life. Where do they go? They do need to reach out to someone for help. And I think there's, again, it's so you can reach out to a coach. So it doesn't always have to be sitting and talking to a therapist. So how I got into this was as a teenager and in my 20s, I had quite a severe anxiety disorder. And therapy itself, as helpful as it was to talk about things, didn't provide me with the tools and strategies to help my anxiety heal. So I created a whole holistic anxiety to confidence program from that. And it's still evolving and growing because there's so much new, wonderful information coming out in these fields, which help, you know, helps the program evolve. But reaching out to someone who you can connect with, like yourself, anyone who thinks, well, do you know what? I could maybe open up to this person and reframing what it means to open up, that it's not a sign of weakness. It's absolutely 100% a sign of strength. You know, just that reframe, and we need to put that message out, that it's one of the healthiest things you can do. If you want to be successful in life, and you want to be successful in life with your business, then you need training. You can't be expected to just know this stuff all by yourself. Find videos of people who are having help. You know, can set an example for you so that you can see the more people we see as men opening up to other people the more we're likely to do that ourselves. You know, I use TikTok, you know, which is not just little dunks and dancing cats. There are some really good therapists and coaches on there who are guys, females, who are opening up. And you can see in the comments, there are men beginning to respond and talk and open up about what they've been through. The culture is shifting, but we need it to shift more because I said those suicide rates, devastating. And there are children growing up without fathers because their father wasn't able or didn't have the mindset to reach out because they thought it was a sign of weakness. Learn to work with your autonomic nervous system, as I was talking about. You know, meditation. I know it's a bit cheesy. I, you know, I think it's one of the coolest ways to learn self-mastery. And it doesn't have to be done in a hippie way or woo-woo way. It can be done. I like to on my podcast to talk about the neuroscience of it and why we're doing this, why we're going to do this mini meditation exercise and what it does for the brain and body. And I think if we just talked about that a bit more, I think more people would be more open to it, men and women. And learn to journal. One of the craziest things I think that we do as, as a species is we're pretty rubbish when it comes to going to bed in general, but we work really hard all day, distract ourselves as much as possible with the overconsumption of entertainment and then we think that we can just hit the pillow and go straight to sleep. But the brain hasn't had a chance to process anything. It's like, right, okay, so you're going to hit the pillow now. Now we can think about all those things which you've ne neglected all day. <laughs> all the most important things. Yeah, or, or even not important things. The brain can be a bit weird like that at times. But Oh, yeah, you're right. I guess that are making your mind run wild. Yeah. You remember that person I talked to five years ago? They gave you a strange look. And then suddenly you're like, why was that? And your brain can get hooked on these things. Especially if you've got a bit of anxiety, it can really play tricks on you. But yeah, med journaling, get it out onto paper. Learn to journal, learn to process. It takes five minutes or so. These are little things you can do to gain self-mastery and look after your mental health. You know, there's a lot of information It's getting better. But as I said, I think we need to do better to promote. And that is why I love your podcast, because as I said, it's men get neglected a bit. My work reaches a lot of men and women, so I get a nice mix. But you can see the embarrassment a lot of guys have when they come forward. And just by learning some simple tools, and being encouraged to open up and realizing there's no shame in that. It's actually a sign of strength. You can see the progress really quickly. Yeah, it's, it's funny. Often men will come to me, often for my business expertise, right? They want help in working through the work side of their lives. And they know that I help with all parts of life, but they often come because they want to see the performance improvement in the work side, right? Or they have something small at home they want to work on. 
But when we start talking, we start realizing, helping them see their full life, then we begin to, they begin to start realizing that, wow, what I'm doing personally on my own time as well as at home is truly impacting the bottom line at work much more than I realize. And so much of the time we spend together is working through you know, themselves, working through relationships with their family as well and helping them improve and cement those relationships and work through all of those things. And these same issues are you do come up from the anxiety to substance abuse to all of these different pieces do come up because they're all part of, of who we are. And so that's what's so, so amazing is we do try to compartmentalize our lives so often when in the end, it all spills over. And so the, almost the more we try to compartmentalize it in an unhealthy way, the more we start almost bursting at the seams, right? Honestly, it's so good to hear you say that because this is why I like the holistic approach. And I think some people think the word holistic is a bit woo-woo, but it's what we're looking at is holistic means the bigger picture. Yeah, that sounds too good. And yeah, it just doesn't sound right. Exactly. Yeah, it's got a strange connotation with it. But the holistic approach is about the bigger picture. You know, when I work with clients, usually their lifestyles are pretty poor. There might be too much alcohol, they're not sleeping very well, and their eating is terrible. They don't think much about exercise, and they've never heard the word meditation before. Maybe not. They don't really look after themselves. And they think it's something that somebody has to go sit on a rock in the middle of a forest to do, right? Yeah, yeah. They're, they're going to be hugging a tree, and they don't want to. <laughs> they don't want to hug the tree. But when they learn that actually by looking after themselves, the bigger picture that they're going to be more successful at home and at work. If you go to work, you need to be at your optimum. That's my version of it. If, I want to, if I'm at work, I have to be at my optimum. To do that, I'm going to have to eat well. I'm going to have to exercise well. I've got to be hydrated. All the basics have to be there if I want to be successful in a certain area of my life, especially work. So that's why I like to look at the bigger picture with people. So Paul and I, before the show started, we were talking a little bit, and Paul is actually doing a competition tomorrow, right, Paul? Sorry, I put you on the spot here, but a CrossFit competition, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's similar to CrossFit. It's called High Rocks, and I believe I'm competing with a few thousand other people, and it is the biggest challenge I've probably ever done, you know, and I've, you know, I do a lot of different things, but this is going to be my biggest mindset and physical challenge tomorrow morning, yeah. I'm, I'm really excited, I have to say. Yeah, it's bringing up a lot of like... <sighs> so that's why I bring that up is to say all of the preparation that you've done for this, right? I think about all the preparation, months of preparation, and then now even the hours leading up to it. It's just focusing your mind, getting ready, doing it, because you were telling me about some of the things you're doing, preparing. And it made me start just thinking about what we're talking about here. You spend for an event like this all of this time preparing, getting your body ready, getting your mind ready, doing everything you need to for this event to function at an optimal level. But how much time do we spend preparing ourselves to show up in the right way at home or at work, right? Or with our children. And it's interesting. You know, how much training do people spend on their minds? Now, I do quite a lot because it's my job. Yeah, it's your world. Yeah. You know, it's, but you know, say to someone, oh, well, if you journal just for a few minutes, they're like, will it take longer than a minute? You know, I'm not sure I have enough time. I've got Netflix to get to. So my phones already have three more notifications since we started talking. You know, I got to go check those out. We're not prioritizing being at our optimum. We kind of wing it and hope for the best. And, you know, I do talk to people and I do work with some athletes and they spend a lot of time training like I do, but their time spent on mental health, zero, virtually very little. Whilst looking after your physical body is absolutely essential, I believe, for mental health. It's one of those non-negotiables. We need to do other things too. It just can't be that compartmentalized into one area. You know, if you want to be successful at work, if you want to be successful at business and you want to be successful in your family, you've got to be healthy. Because if you're not, all of those things are going to be so much harder and unnecessarily so. Yeah, Paul, I, I know I shared with you a story of mine from several years ago where I was at a time in life where I was managing, oh gosh, I mean, the company, I don't know, we had 150 people or so. And it was tough. I remember on the podcast, we've, we've talked about the story, the, the narrative we have in our head or the soundtrack that's playing in our head and how that can impact how we feel and, and how we show up. And I had a pretty poor soundtrack playing, yet from the outside, it looked as though everything was wonderful. 
the business was successful and things were really going well in general. Even a lot in life, things were going pretty well, but I just didn't feel, I didn't feel right. I didn't feel great. I was uh, working too many hours at work to the point where even though we were successful, I wasn't being the right type of leader, right? I wasn't delegating properly. I wasn't prioritizing properly at work. And what I didn't realize is I thought it was because I wasn't as good of a leader as some of the other people, right? I was comparing myself to some other leaders that I saw that I thought had it figured out. Even though performance rise, we were similar, but I would look at them and, and I would compare myself and feel like I was failing. And really in the end, it was just some very small tweaks that I needed to do in order to help fix it. But I couldn't see that for myself. This was right before I hired my first coach, actually. And it's funny. I mean, I remember I came home from work. My wife had somewhere she needed to go. We had a few kids at the time. And I remember coming into the house. I can, I can just visualize it now. I walked into the house from the garage. And there was a little storage room right off to the side as you walked in. The kitchen was to the left and the storage room was to the right. And I remember my family being in the, in the left of the storage room. And the kids were screaming. And it was kind of busy and chaotic. And my wife needed to go. So I was going to need to take the kids. And all of the stress, all the everything I had been holding on to for honestly probably months, right? that were just boiling up, just came out. And my heart started racing and I just started crying. And I, which is like hard for me to even admit, right? And back then it was so hard. Like that's never, like that never really happened to me. And so I remember I went into the storage room and I just, I just kind of laid there. And I remember our little dog at the time came in and, and actually came and laid by me. This is a dog that never sits down, <laughs> right? She would never sit down, but she came and just sat by me for, for about an hour and just could see that I was struggling. And and I remember my wife came in for a minute, but she had to help with the kids. And I just remember feeling just all the story going on in my head, all of these different things. And I didn't know what it was. I'm like, what's wrong with me? I lead all of these people at work. They rely on me to be the leader. They rely on me to be the strong one. And what would happen if they could see me right now? They would think I was weak. They would think I'm not a great leader. My kids in the other room, I started thinking, oh, here's my kids seeing their dad break down and cry because of things are so hard. Like why, you know, this is so unhealthy, so bad. And I could hear my wife in the other room saying, it's okay. Dad's all right. He just had kind of a tough day and da, 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 da. And, and I remember they just wanted to help. They weren't judging me. They just wanted to give me a hug, which they did. I think about all the emotion of that day, just culminating and coming out. And I never told anybody about that story for years, let alone share it on a podcast or social media. Until I got to the point where I realized if none of us ever talk about these things that happen, no one is ever going to realize that it's okay to reach out to someone to get help. For me, being able to express it, it would have been so much better if I could have talked to someone before, right? But I was able to talk to my coach. I finally went and got a coach. I found somebody to help me work through what I thought was going to be some of the work side of things, right? I thought it was going to be the work side of things, but they helped me figure out the other side of my life and get all of it figured out. And then they helped me figure out the work side. And I became a much better leader, way more success, spent more time at home after the fact, and have been a much better example to my children since. And when those emotions come up now, I have the tools to handle it now which is the whole reason that I want to help other people do the same way. Paul, it's the same thing with you, right? It's the whole reason you do this because you know that you can help people. They don't have to be live in that same world where I lived. So Paul, as I share that story, what comes up for you? What do you do for people when they come in that type of a situation? If there's somebody listening right now, and they're trying to figure out, well, maybe they're not ready to talk to someone yet. Mm, okay. And they're in that situation with me. They don't want to talk to someone yet. What can they do to manage it in the meantime until they can get to that point where they're ready to talk to someone? Managing that autonomic nervous system. Because what you were describing just then, Clint, was that buildup is your body. In a way, it's known as allostatic load, which is the wear and tear on your nervous system, your body. So again, it's after a certain point, the pressure you put yourself under for whatever reason, and it's not your fault. This is the thing we have to help people realize that even if they're in that position and they're struggling to even open up, 
There should be no shaming of that. It's not their fault. It's not their fault. But they do have to take responsibility for it. Now they begin to think about it. We all have to take responsibility for what's going on. But it's learning to work with the autonomic nervous system, calm it down, because that's going to help reduce stress. When you work with the autonomic nervous system, you're managing stress, anxiety, anger, and negative emotions. You're learning to manage them. Yet you're turning down the dial so you can think more cognitively. And then by working with that process, again, it comes back to reframing what we think about getting help. Maybe even the word help is negative for some people. Getting training, having coaching. People are happy to, in, in school, most, I don't know what it's like. In, in the UK, we have different type of coaches. I'm happy you brought that up, Paul. That's exactly right, is framing it in a way that can work for you. Yeah, I think the word therapy has a negative connotation for some people. They just imagine themselves set for hours, years, talking to a stranger about their innermost feelings. And that brings up a lot of anxiety for people. But to come and have coaching, learn how your nervous system works. This is how your brain works. What would you like to do? What is it that you? this is impacting on? What's the cost of not learning to how to manage your mind and body? What do you want? And then as you begin to create that, you know, we do the future self-coaching. Where do you want to be in your future? Connect with that person. They exist. It's a timeline. So I like to point, it's a timeline where the future you exist, living the life you really authentically want to live. And then through the psychology of prospection, you begin to adopt those habits now. And I bet you, and I, I say to my clients, I bet you that person is open. They're able to talk about things more freely because in their mind, they know. Not only is it the right thing to do, it's a sign of strength. But it's not going to be easy. <laughs> you know, as we talked about it before, courage is not going to be easy. But that's okay. And this is where resilience comes from. You know, no new become adaptable. This is where confidence comes from. They're a sign of progression. But realizing that you will, even if it's uncomfortable, like my high rocks thing tomorrow. Yeah, I'm uncomfortable thinking about what's coming ahead. But I'm okay with that. I don't think I should have and shouldn't have those sorts of feelings just because I'm a mindset coach. I'm okay with being vulnerable about it because I can't quite yet work out how it's going to happen. But that's okay. I don't mind that. I'll work with my nervous system so that I'm in control. That for me is essential, as well as learning those tools so that you can then create your path forward, create hope. And if you have hope, then your how it becomes much easier when you've got a really good why. Yeah. When people are able to get clear on where they want to go, and then, like you said, have that hope to know that, that it's possible. And not only possible, but it's a part of your future. It's a part of your future already. You just need to choose to start walking that direction. Yeah. Be, do, have. You know, it's very simple. Be that future person now. They're not your future self is not going to swoop in and save you and rescue you later on down the road. That is not going to happen. If you think that there's a future you're going to sort yourself out, going to rescue you, then what you're saying is that you're a victim and you're waiting to be rescued. And that victim mindset, something that I've, I've talked about on a recent episode on my podcast, is coming out in a couple of weeks, I think. It's a very toxic mindset where it's poor me, always being protective, always worrying about what's going to happen in the future. And yet we can train ourselves out of it. It's a natural state of mind. We evolved that way for thousands of years. It protected us. But me and you, we're privileged enough not to have to fight for our lives today. The only thing that we might have to worry about is something emotional. And if anything that our minds come up with, which is catastrophizing or negative, are simply going to be a false alarm. And working with the brain and body, it becomes much easier to recognize that. Well, Paul, this has been a great conversation. I am so grateful for all of your all of your insights. And, and I know that they are going to be helping a lot of different men. And I know we have women that listen to the show as well that are listening to be able to help themselves and help those that, that they care about. Because when we start hearing about some of those stats that you were sharing earlier about the struggles that so many men go through, uh, this is a very real problem. And this is a call to all of you men out there that are listening. Talk to someone, right? Whether it's Paul or myself or someone else that you trust, talk to someone and work through this. Because 
there are some small things you can do that will give you great rewards and help you on your journey. So Paul, as we kind of end here, I, I want to ask you, what's exciting you right now as we end? What's got you super excited? Okay, so there's a couple of things. Ah, it's a good, it's a good question. So a couple of things I'm really enjoying at the moment. So I've just interviewed on my podcast, Ryan Gottfriedson, the best-selling author of Success Mindsets. And uh, there is a whole bunch of mindset stuff I never knew, especially around the, the neurology and the uh, neurochemistry. Ryan was very informative. So I'm diving deep into that at the moment and, and speaking to her again, you know, shortly in the future. But I'm also really interested in the future self-work and exploring and, and both a lot on that. Yeah, we're part of a mastermind where we are brainstorming and talking about exploring more about the psychology of the future self and how we can incorporate that in coaching. So that's really exciting me because I come from a therapy background where a lot of it was focused on I'm behaving this way because of what I did in my past. And with future self coaching, there's a psychology approach which is actually saying, well, your future is dictating also your behaviors. Where do you want to be? What do you want to do? And we often ignore that part. So I'm really fascinated by that and exploring that much more and incorporating that into my work. So yeah, there, there are two things that I'm really excited about at the moment. I've loved sharing that with clients and just how much it helps people. It's amazing. It gives people hope. Yes, it does. It helps, it helps shift everything. You talk about a change in your mindset. It truly helps shift your mindset and helps you get excited, not in a way where you look at your future self and think, oh my goodness, I'm never going to become that person. You compare yourself to this perfect ideal. Instead, you say, that is me in the future and I'm going to start doing that now and get ex and gives you excitement instead of the feeling of overwhelm. So, it's so fun. And one thing I like to say to clients is, my clients are very good at predicting the future. And it's the equivalent of going to a psychic and just saying, I'm going to pay you just to give me the bad news. <laughs> you know, it's just going to, yeah. I, just, I just want to hear one side of it. Don't tell me the good news. Don't tell me all the positive things you think are going to happen for me. Just tell me the bad news. And that's how our minds kind of evolved. We keep focusing a lot on the negatives, ignoring or minimizing the idea that things could go right. And we're the creators of our future. We're the creators of our future selves. We're the designers. And as I said, it's doing it with intention and working towards it is one of the most invaluable things I've ever done. It changed my world. I mean, I looked at this a couple of years ago. I did it from another coaching book. And I thought to myself, Paul, I need to get my act together. <laughs> this, my future is not going to happen. That is not going to happen if I don't actually take action today. And I did. I took action that day and put some things into place. And it was transformative. But I just didn't focus on my future self the way that I could have, and I didn't even entertain it. So as I said, that's why I think it's a, I think it's the way forward in coaching, but to work with it on a deeper level than maybe that's been talked about before. And Dr. Benjamin Hardy has been talking about that, and we're all exploring it and working it into our work in our own ways, which is absolutely fascinating. It's the whole quote, you know, they say, when was the best time to plant a tree? 20 years ago or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. The next best time is today, right? You know, there's a lot of variations of that quote. I think about the same thing for you and I, we had struggles earlier on years ago and we kind of felt like I hit my bottom in that respect years ago and have now been able to overcome so much of that. Life still gets hard. It still throws things at you and you have to continue to learn and adapt and it, it keeps happening. That's life. But yet I can tell you years down the line, you know, years later after kind of hitting that bottom and coming around there's a much better life available to you as you shift some of these subtle things. And it's the snowball effect. It gets better and better and better. It doesn't mean things don't get in your way. It doesn't mean things get hard, but your ability to cope with them and to impact things gets, gets better and better. So Paul, if people want to find you, because I know you've helped a lot of people and your podcast is fantastic. And a lot of your videos and your coaching and so many of these things can help so many people. So where can people find you? In your show notes. That's the best place to find me. But also Google the Mindset Change Podcast. All my contact details are there. Come and listen to the show as well. 
come and meditate with me. Come and meditate. Come and do something cool with your brain. There's lots of things I do within my podcast. I do uh, some hypnosis sessions because I'm a trained hypnotist. I do meditations. I talk about all sorts of bits and pieces. You've been on my show. I've had amazing guests. So it's such a, a whole mix of different things all geared towards helping someone change their mindset so they can change their life. Paul, thank you so much for being here today. It was truly a pleasure to have you on. Oh, no, absolutely a pleasure. Thank you so much for asking me. Thank you. So until next week. Thanks for joining me on this week's episode of the Unrivaled Man Podcast. I'm Clint Hoops, and if this show has impacted you, please share it with a friend or leave a review on Apple Podcasts.